Canadians are preparing to head to the polls, and no surprise, the economy has been at the top of the election agenda. But with the economy stagnating, is it possible to encourage innovation? Joining us now to answer that question, in Waterloo, Ontario, Mariana Matsukato, economist and the author of The Entrepreneurial State. Signora Matsukato, it is delightful to have you back here on TVO. Come va oggi? It's great to be back. I'm just, it's just too bad we're not live. It's too bad we're other. not in the same studio as we were last <laughs> right. time. That is true. Well, as I indicated in the setup, we're, we're going through quite a debate in this country right now as to how much the government really can influence the state of economic affairs in the country. So why don't we just start with that general question. Can't, do, do governments today, particularly a government like the Canadian government, which is not like the American government, we don't have this massive, uh, massively huge economy uh, relative to them, can they really change the direction of the economy on the basis of what they do? Well, absolutely. I don't think, by the way, that the size of the country matters. We can talk later, if you want, about countries like Denmark, which are doing absolutely incredible things in terms of interacting with China, for example, on what China's doing around the Green Revolution. But, you know, coming back just to the general question, what is the role of the state in the economy? The first thing is we have to remember the state is not a family. A family does have to live within its means. Um, through public policy, both monetary and fiscal policy, the state can, you know, create growth. You can actually affect your own budget, both through money creation, uh, but also, obviously, through fiscal spending and the multiplier, so the spending rounds that occur after the government uh, intervenes in the economy, that can actually make the GDP pie bigger. And, of course, all that one really should worry about is the proportion of debt to GDP. If debt was just increasing without it having any effect on GDP, that would be a problem. But it's, it's the relationship between the two. And there's absolutely evidence that over the last hundreds of years, um, you know, different governments, when they spend in a strategic way in all those areas, for example, that increase productivity, but also, of course, infrastructure, but also the actual technologies that are behind some of the smartest products out there, including the iPhone, everything behind the iPhone that makes it a smartphone was publicly funded, that creates decades of growth which increases the denominator of the debt-to-GDP relationship. You said something in there that I suspect will have conservatives' heads exploding, and so I want to follow up on it. You said families have to live within their means, but governments don't. What do you mean by that? Well, just theoretically, it's a fact. Uh, you know, if you are a family and you start spending on your credit card uh, too much and it's beyond what you're actually bringing in in terms of income, that is uh, a problem. Uh, governments can actually, precisely because they are a government and not a family, they actually have to do the opposite. <laughs> I know this is going to sound a bit uh, controversial, but just think of how we calculate GDP. Okay, GDP, I'm going to make this really simple. Excuse the, uh, you know, teacher uh, coming in here. So GDP is made up of four different components. There's private uh, consumption expenditure, what people spend. Um, there's private business expenditure, that's I, so the consumption is C. Private business expenditure is I. Then there's government spending, which is what we're basically talking about here, that's G. So C plus I plus G, and then there's net exports. Let's just forget about them for a minute. When you have a business cycle, uh, you end up having too much C, too much consumption, personal consumption, too much I, private investment, um, and, uh, sorry, when you have a boom. And so government, you know, in those periods can potentially relax a bit. But when you have the opposite, when you have a recessionary period, and don't forget that economies worldwide are still feeling the waves of the financial crisis, which created an economic crisis worldwide, and the ripples are still being felt even in Canada, because it's part of a global economy, then government really should be doing um, the opposite, because you have too little consumption, too little private business investment. So if government also cuts back, that's why we go from recessions to depressions. And in fact, before government started to play this role, and it started to play this counter-cyclical role, so doing the opposite of what private consumers and private businesses did, mm -hmm. so if you want, before World War II, we often had depressions. There was one depression after another. We also had constant deflation, uh, because don't forget that, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, government expenditure, which is not too high, um, that creates both growth, but also it creates a bit of inflation, but as long as it's, you know, between sort of 3 and 4%, that's not a big deal. So if you look between 1800 
and say 1950, there was basically depressions every 15 to 20 years. We've forgotten about that. We remember the Great Depression, but basically what happened, which is that after World War II, governments learned worldwide that they had to act counter-cyclically. Otherwise, we would get this constant uh, 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 problems of serious economic downturns constantly. Now, then the question is, what does that mean for the boom? In periods when you start to have some growth, uh, like the Canadian economy today, can the government just step back completely? And that's where you get into these more strategic kinds of investments, which are crucial. This is not, no longer just about counter-cyclical. You have to be sure that you're spending in those areas that actually allow productivity growth, which is, of course, important for all sectors. And so not just about infrastructure, but human capital formation, training, um, education, but also helping companies, which alone tend not to invest in really high-risk areas, to make those investments. So, you know, the internet, nanotech, biotech, and clean technology have all been really spurred on by these strategic investments, um, irrespective of the business cycle. This is not just about getting us out of a recession. So those economies that don't do that, they might feel proud that they have a surplus or a balanced budget, but they're not going to be too proud in 10 years when they're completely lagging behind the world leaders that are making those investments. Okay, one more follow-up on this before we go on to talk about innovation, and that is I want to ask you about the G in that equation, the government spending here. Yeah. There are, and I'm not asking you to take a position on which party's got the best position in this election campaign. I know you don't want to do that anyway. Having said that, the Liberal Party of Canada does have on offer uh, $60 billion over the next few years of added deficit spending in order to, quote unquote, prime the pump and help the economy in the way that you just suggested. My question is, in a $2 trillion economy, which is Canada, yeah. can $10 billion a year of extra deficit financing on all of those things that you just mentioned really make a difference? Well, that's, that's what's interesting, right? Because it's being portrayed, at least, what I've seen in the Canadian media. I've just arrived yesterday, but I've been reading up. Um, it's as though these three positions are so starkly different, right? So you have the Conservatives saying they want to run a surplus. Uh, it's a minor surplus. It's 0.1%, this 1.9 billion, right? That's 0.1% yes. of the GDP in Canada. You have the NDP that says they want a balanced budget, which is not that different from this 0.1%. And then you have the Liberal Democrats, of course, sorry, the, um, the Liberal, sorry, yep. uh, saying that they want to run a deficit. But th the actual deficit they're talking about is really not massive when you compare it to countries, you know, whether you look at the U.S. in 2009, that was running a 10% deficit, and in doing so set up agencies, new agencies like ARPA-E in the Department of Energy to fuel you know, the green innovation investments, copying what DARPA did in the Department of Defense, but also um, you know, uh, countries worldwide, including Germany. You know, Germany has not been running a balanced budget or a surplus. They have been deficit financing their growth. And that's because doing productive things costs money. <laughs> so um, you know, I do think that uh, running a surplus or balanced budget is really not an issue. That's not what governments should be really worried about. Now, then the question is, is it OK simply to run a deficit and just feel happy that you're doing it or worried that you're doing it? Well, the point is, what are you actually spending the money on? Mm -hmm. And is it on areas that are going to create growth? So again, you keep your debt to GDP in check. But currently, the debt to GDP ratio in uh, Canada is something like 31%. Yes. That is really, really low. There is absolutely no concern. Even if it went to 40 or 50, it shouldn't be concern. Um, you have you know, the US over 100. Uh, Germany, I think, is 78%. These numbers don't matter. They do matter, of course, when they're too high, if they're above, say, 120 or so. Um, but the kind of window that you're operating in in Canada, it really you know, is not a problem. You could perhaps have no growth with a low uh, debt-to-GDP ratio, or you might have a lot of growth eventually. It, it ma you know, the details matter. What are you actually spending on? And that's where a plan is important. What is the current project? What is the mission? What, what kind of economy do you want to build? Uh, how do you want to compete with the world leaders? And what kind of investments do both the private, because of course it's not just about public, the, both the private and the public sector have to be making together in order to compete with China, with Germany, with the US, with uh, Denmark, uh, with Italy. Um, and I think what's, what's striking is how little 
the debate seems to be centered on those details, even though, of course, I have heard the liberals saying that, you know, they want to focus on social investments, transit, and, uh, and green, yes. which, you know, all sound fine, but details do matter. Sure. And, you know, part of the details mean uh, what are the actual public institutions that you have created in this country? Have they been investing in their own capabilities and capacities so they can inter uh, interact with these societal and technological challenges? And that really matters, because it's not just about throwing money at different areas. In which case, let me circle back now to your first answer, where you said something's happening in Denmark. You didn't say there was something rotten happening in the state of Denmark. You, I, see, I think you said there's something good <laughs> happening in the state of Denmark uh, on the issue of the government's participation in the economy and investing in innovation and so on. What's that story? Well, I'll just say it briefly because, you know, there is this whole issue of manufacturing and services and countries worrying if, you know, their manufacturing base is falling and perhaps the economy starts to get too skewed towards services. And I think the Danish story is a really interesting one because they've been able to compete on both sides, on both manufacturing and services, in a particular area, which really is this green transition. Um, green is not just about renewables, by the way, you know, solar, wind, and biofuels. It's about, um, you know, transforming the entire economy, just like IT really changed how lots of different sectors work. And so the fact that I wanted to uh, uh, mention is that um, not only is Denmark today alongside China and Germany one of the countries that's investing the most in renewable energy, if you compare it to its, um, you know, GDP, it's one of the uh, two to three leaders. Uh, but it also, because it's done it in such a dynamic way, because it has invested also in its innovation system around that area, they've also become the number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. And China is spending about $1.7 trillion in five different sectors, which are all kind of green-oriented. So it's just fascinating because, you know, you began by talking about the size of Canada. Can it really, you know, do what the U.S. does? So there was an underlying assumption that, you know, size matters. And I would say that what really matters is vision, mission, a plan, which doesn't mean supporting just one little sector, whether it be automotives or, you know, renewable energy. It means how do you want to transform the economy, make it less skewed, less dependent on a few sectors. And of course, Canada, like Norway, um, is too uh, a focused on extractive industries. How do we, you know, extend the innovation system across different sectors? Often that's done through having a direction for the whole economy to move into. So IT was really a direction for the entire U.S. economy. Green today is, is a potential direction that economies can take both in terms, obviously, of renewable energy, but also in terms of how we rethink production, consumption, and distribution across all sorts of different sectors. Germany is doing this, by the way, with its energy event policy. Does it appear to you that Canada has, as it relates to innovation, an intelligent investment strategy at hand? Well, uh, well, I'm in Waterloo for a very interesting conference on, you know, which is precisely debating that question. And of course, there's, you know, different regions that might be thinking about this in, in more creative ways. Waterloo being, you know, part of an area of, of, of Canada, which I think is really thinking seriously about how to build an innovation system. The problem is that when the national debate, and just think of your electoral debate, is so caught up in a static question, meaning also an inertial question, which is, should the government step in or step out? We forget then to have the real debate, which is, of course, the government should step in, but what should it actually do? And one of the problems uh, I think that Canada has had over the years, um, and I don't see much movement on this, is just how much public money is spent indirectly, not directly. Indirectly, I mean through different types of tax credits, including R&D tax credits uh, for the innovation economy. There's very little evidence that that works. And what I mean by that is there's very little additionality. Sorry to use this technical term, but it's a very useful term, because what it means is, um, is that policy, in this particular case, an R&D tax credit, making R&D happen that wouldn't have happened anyway? If it would have happened anyway, it's a, it's a waste of public money. And so this isn't just about spending more money, it's also about wasting less. And many tax credits, unless they're accompanied by also direct spending, which actually creates new technological and market opportunities, which then drives business investment, because businesses only invest if they see an opportunity, if these tax credits are not accompanied by these strategic, mission-oriented direct investments, like all the ones I mentioned were behind the iPhone, then 
they don't work very much. And in fact, uh, Canada's bird rate, and I don't mean how many birds it has, <laughs> I mean uh, the amount that businesses, that's the B, spend in R&D, so business spending in R&D, bird as a proportion of GDP, has been falling. Not only is it one of the lowest in the OECD, it's 0.88 of 1%, it's been falling. Well, um, This is a problem. And one of the reasons is that, again, businesses don't necessarily see across many different sectors. I mean, there is, um, you know, R&D in some sectors, but it's definitely not across the Canadian industry, don't necessarily see these opportunities being generated in Canada, and so don't invest in research and development, and yet, unfortunately, keep asking for these tax cuts or, or reductions in different types of red tape, as though that's the only real problem. I think the Conservative government's position on these things, though, uh, in some ways jibes with yours insofar as they don't necessarily believe more people are going to take transit if you give them a tax credit for doing so or more people are going uh, to play sports if you give them a tax credit for doing so or more people will invest in R&D if you give them a tax credit for doing so but they want to reward people for doing that and they find these boutique tax cuts appropriate for that reason are they well that's interesting because you've just given an example on the consumption side and actually um, you know, the nudging versus kicking, <laughs> the nudging that occurs through different types of tax incentives on the consumption side, so changing how consumers behave, there is evidence that that tends to work actually quite a bit because consumers are driven by uh, their disposable income. In fact, again, sorry if I go back to the technicalities, but it's really important actually to have some evidence-based policies. If we go back to GDP, right, C plus I plus G plus this X minus N, which is the net exports, the C, the private um, consumption, is in fact more or less a function of disposable income. So if you increase this, people's disposable income by reducing their, you know, different types of uh, taxes that they pay, like VAT, which is a regressive tax, by the way, because everyone's paying the same proportion if you're rich or poor, that might increase their consumption. Or if you give them a tax incentive to buy more green type of, you know, products and services that will affect their consumption. Whereas what I was talking about was business investment. Business investment, if you just plot it, if you ever get a time series, which you probably can through your uh, national uh, statistics service, if you just plot the I, it's extremely volatile. You know, it's like this. It's not like consumption, which is a monotonic function of disposable income. It's very volatile. It's, um, it's unpredictable. This is why Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, used the word animal spirits. He meant that investment is driven not just by little tweaks and taxes, but by the gut instincts about opportunities. And so, if you just reduce businesses' tax, they don't necessarily invest, because what's actually driving their investment are these animal spirits, gut instincts, about where these future opportunities are. <laughs> so often, these tax cuts are just a redistribution of income. In fact, they often increase inequality. And, and it's also interesting who's, who's lobbying for those tax cuts. In the US, for example, between 1976 and 1981, capital gains tax fell by 50%, that's 5-0 from 40% to 20%, and was lobbied for by the National Venture Capital Association through this whole narrative of how you know, risk-taking and innovative and uh, entrepreneurial they were, when actually you know, all that did was make them a lot richer, and they continued to invest only in those areas where they saw you know, lots of public money going into, which was creating completely new landscapes. So you know, the US government just last year spent $32 billion, $32 billion, on the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sector. And that is what's sort of driving lots of biotech uh, investments. They follow this public money. Well, given that you're in Waterloo, let's finish up on a question about innovation and wh whoever becomes the winner of the next federal election. And right now, it's about a third, a third, a third. So we have no idea who that's going to be. But whoever it is, why don't you give them some advice right here, right now, on what government policy they could undertake in order to spur on innovation in a meaningful way? Well, the first thing I think that's really important is to engage in a completely different way. So politicians need to engage in a completely different way with business. We need a proper business forum, and I would urge you know, whoever wins to immediately, the second day that they're in office, to actually uh, set up a forum with those businesses, those few businesses, because there's not that many, that actually want to be engaging alongside government investments on these big new societal and technological challenges. Because that means that when government wants to spur growth, it doesn't just have to hear the constant complaints about too much bureaucracy, too much red tape, too 
much tax and end up having to react to these uh, pretty mediocre requests, but actually engage in a productive symbiotic, not parasitic, way alongside the business community. And I think you do have some really great businesses here and business leaders, I've just been speaking to some today here in Waterloo, who would really be useful to um, that discussion. And yet you need a forum. It can't just be you know, after dinner drinks. Um, the other thing is, of course, you need to be investing in infrastructure, but infrastructure is not enough. You need a vision for that infrastructure. It's too easy just to look for shovel-ready projects, whether it be roads or bridges. There needs to be a direction. You know? And so having green infrastructure become part of a green transition in uh, Canada to also make your economy less dependent on old extractive sectors, but also to transform this word that I'm using, green, to become a new direction for all sectors, just like, by the way, suburbanization allowed mass production, which was a technological revolution, to get fully deployed, deployed across many different sectors back in the 20s and 30s, green could become a new direction even for the IT revolution, which we all know hasn't really had the effect it could have. Yeah. And so you know, it's, it's infrastructure, it's human capital formation, it's research, it's new you know, supporting businesses that want to be investing in very high risk technologies, so providing that kind of patient, long-term committed finance that these businesses need, because don't forget venture capitalists are all exit driven, want their returns in three or five years, that's fine to go from one gadget to the next, but you really need that patient public finance that is willing to wait 15 to 20 years. So we definitely support you maybe thinking of an innovation-centered public bank that provides that kind of finance, because the kind of interaction I'm talking about is really across the whole innovation chain. But you also need a social agenda. You know, innovation for the sake of innovation, uh, you know, what's the social project? You know, how can you actually transform even the welfare state to interact alongside the innovation economy? You obviously need more healthy and educated citizens, which increases your potential pool of future innovators. So inequality is really bad for innovation. Hmm. As always, you give us so much to think about. And for those who think the title of your book, The Entrepreneurial State, is an oxymoron, now having listened to you, they now know why it isn't. Mariana Matsukato, always good of you to join us here on TVO. Enjoy your time here in Canada, and thanks so much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Alla prossima volta. Arrivederci. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.